Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. That's right. It's Saturday. What does that mean? It's time for the weekly recap of all of the top stories that we brought to you throughout the week. Now, we hope that you go back and watch all of the videos in their entirety, but if you haven't been able to do that, here are the top stories. Catch up. We'll see you next week on Crime Talk. Last week seemed like it was a little slow on news, but this week is already off to a great start. Why, you may ask? Well, new documents have been released in regards to the Lori Vallow matter, the one in Arizona. As you may recall, Lori Vallow was charged basically conspiring with Alex Cox, her boyfriend, in regards to the death of her then husband. Well, a trove of emails and photos have been released by the police investigating that case, and they may appear to show the last pictures of her seven-year-old son before he was allegedly murdered. That's right, and his sister. Um, the photos, which were recovered from Lori Vallow's iCloud account, they include one shot of JJ in red pajamas dated September 22nd of 2019, which is what investigators to be is the last photo of JJ alive. There were also some photographs of ammunition taken from an Idaho gun store. Not exactly sure how that plays in, except for the fact that, as you may recall, Tammy DeBell was shot at. She may have thought that it was something else, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's another shot, another screenshot of a plane ticket that reveals Vallo had booked a flight under a false name from Idaho to Phoenix Mesa Gateway the day after Vallo's brother attempted to shoot Tammy DeBell. Hmm, I guess that's the ammunition. And why would you book a plane flight unless you wanted to make sure you were not in the area, perhaps establishing an alibi, hmm, perhaps. Other pictures that were discovered on the iCloud account were taken from a California hotel and they appeared to date between November 28th and December 1st when police were actually searching for Vallow's two children. Now the photographs are in addition to some heavily redacted 2,500 emails and they've been produced via a public information request from the Chandler Police Department. They've also been released now that an indictment has actually uh, come down. As you may recall, she was indicted for conspiracy to commit conspiracy to commit murder in relation to the death of her ex-husband, Charles Vallow, who was shot to death by her brother, Alex Cox. And this was back on July 11th. This was all in regards to a custody dispute in regards to their son, JJ. Now, the police originally ruled that uh, Cox was acting in self-defense. They, uh, There were some irregularities for sure, but the other Lori Vallow matters made the police look a little closer and determined that uh, everything that Alex Cox had indicated did not make sense. Now, we have talked about this before, and we're gonna start going through all these emails, but. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not telling anybody to commit crime, but the cell phone, right? The cell phone, the ones that we all carry around, this thing has so much data and it's amazing. People just do not realize the amount of data that is acquired. Every time you drive down the street and you know, it says, hey, would you like to join this particular uh, Wi-Fi account? that is all getting recorded without your information. I've seen cases where people were seen casing the bank, driving around, all coming from cell phone data. Now, not that I'm saying commit crime, but if you're going to, don't take your cell phone for God's sakes. And if you're going to commit crime, you probably shouldn't do it via text messages and email. The bottom line is that it is all saved. And even if you think you've deleted it from this little phone here, no, it still is going to be backed up, assuming you have iCloud or some other storage device that saves everything that goes on in your phone in regards to emails, uh, photographs, and text messages. If it's all there, guess what? 
they're going to find it. They're going to find it. And I've said this once and I will say it again. It is always, it is always the defendant's own words that come back and bite them. And what I mean bite them means get them convicted. Okay. And some people seem to think that, and particularly people that get arrested think the only thing that ever matters is what I say to the police upon my arrest. No, it's anything you say, right? They're warning you. Anything you tell us right now when they give you a Miranda advisement, but it's anything that you've said to anyone comes in and is admissible against you as an admission by a party opponent. Obviously it has to be relevant, but it's admissible. And people seem to forget that. Oh, I'll write a novel about what I'm going to do. Go do it. Well, you can't use that. I didn't say that to the police. It all comes in, ladies and gentlemen. It all comes in. We're going to continue to watch new information on Lori Vallow. It's going to get good. These, these emails, I'm telling you, they're going to be the demise of Lori Vallow and uh, Chad Bell. Mark my word. Let's get straight to the docket. As we mentioned yesterday, documents regarding the evidence, what is supporting the indictment for uh, the charges against Lori Vallow in regards to the charges of conspiracy to commit murder in regards to the death of husband number four, Charles Vallow, have been released and they're making their way and we have been reviewing uh, what we have to date. And it is leaving me scratching my head. And we can talk about this more when we go live tonight. But the interview that's given by Alex Cox just doesn't make sense, okay? Um, he states, Alex Cox states to the police officer that he got hit in the back of the head with a bat. He didn't see the bat coming. Um, he had a gun, and apparently Charles Vallow had a bat. And we're not even talking about the forensics. I'm just telling you, based upon the answers that were given by Alex Cox that day, when he was interviewed, I am very, very surprised that Alex Cox was not arrested either that day or within 24 hours, okay? For there to be self-defense, you have to be in imminent fear of serious bodily injury or death, okay? But you have to fight fair, so to speak. So if you bring a gun to a knife fight, you probably, it's not balanced. Yes, you could be in fear, but it has to be a reasonable fear. If the person never came with you and they had a knife, it's not enough to just harm that other individual. Um, there has to be a reasonable fear. So in this particular case, based upon the statements that I've seen, and I will give you this caveat, I have not seen it all, and I am not criticizing the police department down there, they probably figured, hey, we got time. This guy's not going anywhere. We know where to find him. Well, little did they know he was moving on. But the reality of it is I'm surprised uh, the case wasn't presented to the district attorney and uh, charges not filed. Why? The story just didn't make sense. But that would have bought a little more time for the district attorney to file charges. Yes, a district attorney has to have uh, or has an ethical obligation not to file charges unless they believe they can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm telling you, I think I would go to trial as a DA uh, charging Alex Cox uh, with murder, maybe something in the second degree, perhaps, maybe even a heat of passion. Uh, first degree murder, yeah, based upon what we probably know now, but um, I'm surprised it didn't happen. And guess what? If Alex Cox had been charged, and I'm not holding, I'm not throwing stones at anybody here. I'm just saying if he had been charged based upon the facts that they knew shortly after the death of Charles Vallow, probably the death of Kylie, JJ, or uh, Tammy Daybell. You never know with these, the bunch that they had going on there, but you really have to wonder. Not trying to be too cynical, but that's just the way it is. All right, let's get to the docket today. Remember Michael Avenatti, you know, the big famed attorney who represented Stormy Daniels. Well, he kind of crossed the line, tried to extort money from Nike. Unfortunately for Mr. Avenatti, somebody at Nike knew somebody at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and bam, next thing you know, he was indicted. Kind of started a spiral downward for Mr. Avenatti. He was sentenced to two and a half years for that extortion case. 
And he'll have to serve that obviously in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Well, Mr. Avenatti had some other problems. He still has the trial for allegedly stealing the money from his client for her book advance. That's right, Stormy Daniels. Not can't can't steal clients' money. And then he has a case that's starting today in federal court in California. What's he being charged for? Well, he has a 36 count indictment that includes counts of embezzlement, wire fraud, tax evasion, bankruptcy fraud, and bank fraud. Now, the trial taking place concerns only the wire fraud counts and the other charges will be tried at a later date. Why do they do that? Well, a wire fraud is probably the easiest for the uh, jury to consider as well as the easiest for the prosecution to prove. And the bifurcated trial would take place. The counts have been severed. And normally that's because either A, the defense is raising claims that I can testify as to these wire fraud counts, but I may have to assert the Fifth Amendment as to these other counts, and therefore let's sever those out. Or there's an allegation that the other counts are so prejudicial that um, it'll result in an unfair trial. So we'll see how things go for Mr. Avenatti as the week progresses. The gist of these particular charges are that he was stealing clients' money, usually from settlements, and he was not paying them. Does that sound familiar? Hmm, Tom Girardi? Hmm, that's right. It seems like a lot of these uh, personal injury mass tort lawyers uh, really start thinking that the money is going to last forever and uh, live well beyond their means, as it has been alleged that Mr. Avenatti, you know, was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for a lease for a house near the beach driving his Ferrari, but yet he couldn't pay his clients. Hmm. Something is wrong there. I don't think Mr. Avenatti is going to have a good week. We'll give him the presumption of innocence, obviously, and we'll see how things go. I think Mr. Avenatti is, needs to get used to his current living situation for more than the next two and a half years. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Next on the docket, an update on the Paul and Maggie Murdoch case. And the information that brings us today is we've learned some information regarding the BAC of young Paul Murdaugh when he was involved in that boating accident. That's right. After some search warrants were obtained for the medical records, his it was determined that uh, Paul Murdaugh's BAC was a 0.286. Now, the police kind of dragged their feet. Maybe it was confusion. Maybe it was trying to give some preferential treatment to the young Mr. Murdaugh. However, it Nothing was done um, as it relates to Mr. Murdoch. And by the time the police had arrived at the hospital, it also appears that so had Mr. Murdoch's father and grandfather who were experienced prosecutors and basically didn't cooperate and make any statement. Oh, so I guess it's not just me that says to do that. Hmm. Yeah, but that BAC is a 0.286. That is, um, that is three times the le legal limit. Now, some photographs were also uh, turned over, which shows where the uh, young Paul Murdaugh uh, and his friends were uh, getting off the uh, boat. They were in downtown Beaufort. Beautiful. Been there many, many times. In fact, when I was down there just a couple months ago, walked that same little area down by the, uh, uh, by, down by the downtown area. And it shows him with all his friends. There's pictures of him in the bar. 
and them leaving and also the bridge that they hit. And can you imagine uh, completely basically pitch dark at night down there trying to find people that have been thrown from the boat? Not a good situation. Now, there's still no update on any suspects as it relates to who may be responsible for the death of Paul and Maggie Murda. And we'll keep you apprised of any future developments. Next on the docket, Chad DeBell's attorney would finally like to get a copy of those grand jury transcripts. Now, why do you want the grand jury transcripts? And I will be fair to Mr. Pryor here. Sometimes the grand jury transcripts are not always prepared uh, at the time of the indictment. It takes some time. Uh, But as you may recall, uh, the indictment was dated uh, May 24th of 2021. Now, the motion asking for the grand jury transcripts has been filed dated July 23rd, 2021. Now, that's only roughly 60 days or so, but normally this is one of the first motions that you file because as the defense attorney, you want to see the grand jury transcripts. It is going to basically lay out the case that the prosecution presented before the grand jury And that's going to be an abbreviated version of the case that's going to be presented to the jury. It's also going to have key information that the prosecution is going to rely upon. So you can only imagine how important that would be. Normally, anytime I have a case involving grand juries, this is the motion that is filed forthwith, meaning immediately. Now, Mr. Pryor's also filed another motion asking that a change of venue Uh, be granted, and he wants a forthwith hearing on this immediately. However, once again, this is a very boilerplate motion that does not give any specifics as to why the uh, motion for change of venue uh, cannot be granted other than a conclusory statement saying that venue must be changed so that the defendant can receive a fair and impartial jury and that they can't do that in Fremont County. Normally, and we've talked about this in the past, you normally want to attach something that says it's so obvious that he, the defendant can't receive a fair trial. But you normally just can't file a motion saying change of venue. You need to show uh, some sort of data, uh, survey that people have already concluded and made up their mind in the uh, jurisdiction and therefore uh, a small jury pool and this percentage of people that reside in the county, uh, then looking at what percentage of potential jurors would be called for jury duty, you kind of extrapolate um, the jury pool that's going to show up. And we've talked about this before. The thing is, is most judges will say, well, let's wait and see if we can get a jury. So most change of venue motions, uh, they're really not ripe for consideration until the uh, court basically concludes on their own during the voir dire or jury selection process that there basically are not enough jurors in their jury panel to get a fair and impartial jury. But it can usually happen. There's a lot of people that'll say, yes, I'm aware of the case, but I haven't formed an opinion because I haven't heard all of the evidence. And then the jurors will say that I will only make my decision based upon legal and competent evidence, which is evidence admitted in evidence at court to decide the defendant's guilt or innocence. We'll have to wait and see. All right. It's been a busy week. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. We know you have things that you could be doing other than watching this show, this podcast, but we appreciate you doing that. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week on Crime Talk. <music>